Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27 says this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, this is Jesus, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it, had, it, because it had its foundation on the rock. Someone say the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I want to start a new series that we're going to be in the next several weeks, and the title of it is The Healthy Church. The Healthy Church. I don't know if you know this, but there is a lot of cynicism in the modern day we live in when it comes to the church. There is a lot of hurt. There is a lot of wounding. There is a lot of critique, especially here in America. I, I do not believe the answer is to get cynical. I do not believe that we are to just slowly drift downstream with the opinions of the world. No, I believe that we need to rise above it and we need to ask Jesus to make us a healthy church, a healthy church. You know, when people meet me, um, they, they, you know, some people like me, some people are neutral and that's okay. Um, But then later on, people will meet my wife, Camille, and then they'll circle back with me and they go, wow, I got to meet your wife. She is so amazing. Hey, I'm so thankful you guys are here. And I'm like, you didn't say that when you met me before you met my wife, right? But my wife's awesome. I get it. I get it. You know, the church is called to be the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ. And he wants us to engage in this intimate, powerful relationship and union with him where we're worshiping him, we're co-laborers with him, we're partnering with him to the point that when the unchurched, the unbelieving world meets us, they should want to meet our bridegroom. His name is Jesus. Amen? And the, here, here's where the metaphor I just presented breaks down. That when, when people want to meet Jesus more than they meet Jesus, they're going to like Jesus even more than they like us. Amen? And, and so we're called to be the bride of Christ. We're called to be the body of Christ. But we need to ask God to make us a healthy church. Not a perfect church. Not a self-righteous church. Not a church that claims to be the expert and have it all together on everything. But a, but a church that is humble, a church that is aware, a church that is authentic, a church that fears the Lord, and a church that wants to represent his love to be his hands and his feet to a lost and hurting world. And so we're going to look at the biblical principles behind a healthy church over the next few weeks. We're going to look at what it means to have healthy relationships in the church. We're going to look at what it means to have healthy servant leadership in a church. We're going to look at what it means to have healthy mission in a church. And this morning, I want to look at what it means to have a healthy spiritual foundation in our church. And in the parable of the wise and the foolish builder, Jesus lays out consequences for building a structure on a shaky foundation. He talks about the foolish builder who built on the sand. Anyone ever take beach trips before out to the beach, right? My, my, our family, we, we love going to the beach. And one of the first things that we do is our, our custom is we have a little wagon and we come out to the beach uh, with, with our three boys. And the first thing I do is I set up a little beach tent. I don't know if you guys realize this. My wife and I are white people. I don't know if you know this, but I just want to educate you this morning. We are, we are Caucasian. I still haven't found the island of Caucasia, but that's where we're from. And we, we appreciate the sun, but we also need shade, right? Because there's like white, a little bit less than white, and then sunburnt. There's really nothing in between when you're this white, you know? I came back from a vacation one time. I was in Staff Chapel, and I said, guys, we were just at the beach all week. This is as tan as it gets, and they all erupted in laughter. So that meant I, I, wasn't, I wasn't that tan. I wasn't that tan. So all that to say, we need shade. We need shade. We are white people. We need shade. And, and, and so we build this tent. We take stakes out, and, and, and I put the stakes in the, in the sand to hold it down. And then after we get the tent set, then maybe we put like a cooler or, or a chair in the tent so that there's a gust of wind. It doesn't remove itself, you know, fr- from the ground. But the point is that that structure is a temporary structure with stakes in the sand. It is built just to be there for a few hours. It is not built to live in for years. 
right? And that's what happens when you build something in the sand. It's a temporary thing. It's not anything long-term. If we're going to be a healthy church that's able to be a witness for Christ in the city for decades, we must be a church that is building on the rock. We got to build on the rock. We got to build for the long term. I want this church to be set up to be a strong witness for Christ for decades to come, should the Lord tarry. Not just for the next year or two, but for decades. And I don't know how long the Lord will have me be the pastor here at this church, but at the end of the day, should the Lord tarry, I'm the interim pastor, meaning at some point I'm going to hand this off to somebody else. I hope it's not like six months from now. I hope I get a little bit more time than that. But at some point down the line, I'm going to hand this to another leader because this isn't my church. That was okay. That was okay. This isn't my church. This is Jesus' church that he died for and rose from the grave for. And I'm just an under shepherd. He is the chief shepherd. So I want to build it on the rock so that it has a, a, a long future uh, ahead to minister to our world. So the rock in this passage, the rock speaks of Christ. And the sand speaks of disobedience to Christ, that when we're disobedient to Christ, we're building a house, whether it be our personal life or our church, I'll use these interchangeably here, we're building a house personally or building a spiritual house, his church. If we're disobedient to Christ, we're building on the sand. But when we're building on the rock, we're building on Christ. I don't want to make any assumptions here as a teacher of the word. It's a consistent metaphor throughout the biblical narrative that the rock speaks of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul was talking about the Israelites who were delivered from Egypt and were in their wilderness journey towards the promised land. And when they were in the desert, they were dying of thirst, and there was a miracle that happened that, that Moses, uh, God through Moses brought forth water, replenishing water through, through a rock in the desert. And Paul says, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. That the metaphor there in that passage represented the spiritual nourishment for our soul. That even in a dry season in the natural realm, we can find spiritual nourishment for our soul from the rock that is Christ as New Testament believers. Amen. In Ephesians 2.20, Paul is talking about the foundation that's laid through apostles and prophets. But here's what he says about the foundation. He says, Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone of the foundation. The cornerstone was laid first. It had to have the, the, the best 90-degree angle because it set the pattern for the rest of the foundation. If it wasn't a good cornerstone, the rest of the foundation would be off. And so he says, not only is Jesus the rock, he's the chief cornerstone of the foundation. This same uh, language is used by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 8. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, Jesus, rejected by humans, crucified at the cross, basically, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall." Jesus used this same language as a self-description in Matthew 21, 42. And so you have this New Testament pattern of the rock being symbolic of Christ. You, you continue to have it in the Old Testament. I won't read all the passages, but very quickly here. In the Old Testament, in Psalms 95, 1, it says that he is the rock of salvation. He's the rock of our salvation. It says in Psalms 18, 2, that he is the rock of refuge. That he, he, he is a strong tower that we can run to in times of trouble. He's a rock of refuge. It says in Isaiah 26, 4, that he is the rock of ages. That he is eternal. Jesus is unchanging. Jesus is unbending. As the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is a rock that we can build our life upon and our church. And so foundation, it speaks of priority. 
You don't build a house structure and then build the foundation. I mean, if I was doing the building as a pastor with no history of manual labor, that's how I would build it, but that would be wrong. First you build the foundation before you build the structure. So it speaks of priority. Foundation speaks of immovability. You can't move the foundation without destroying the structure that's built upon it. So the foundation has to be immovable. It speaks of character. You know, your reputation is what other people see, but your character is what God sees. It's the same for the church. We have an outward-facing presentation to our community, and our reputation is what our community sees, but our character, who we really are as a church, is what God sees. And we want our character to be built on the rock of Christ. And so we have to ask ourselves this question, is the church being built on the foundation of Christ? Because if it is, we're building on a rock that can withstand the tests and trials of, of the day. But if we're building on sand, we will, we will be destroyed. We will be taken backwards when things happen in our country. I don't know, like say COVID-19. There was a lot of weaknesses in the Big C Church exposed during COVID-19. I don't want to paint this with too broad of a paintbrush because it's only fair to take each church and, and go on a case-by-case -case example. But, but some churches had to shut down during COVID and they never opened back up. Some churches, they reemerged after COVID, but they didn't reemerge with the same strength that they had pre-COVID. And what was exposed is that there was parts of the church that were built, but they weren't built on Jesus. They were built on superficial things. They were built on, 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 on having uh, being cool, or they were built on having a lot of followers on social media. And nothing wrong with some of those things, but I hope that's not the foundation of our church and the Big C Church. And so a couple thoughts I have for you this morning as we look at how do we be a healthy church in this area of having a healthy spiritual foundation. And we're going to move on to other areas in the coming weeks. How many knows it's good to start on week one with something foundational? <laughs> okay, so here's the first thought. Any foundation other than Christ is a temporary distraction. It's a temporary distraction. That's what Jesus was talking about when he talked about the sand, that, that it can shift and, and it's, it's movable. It's, it's temporary. It won't endure. It won't last. It will fade away over time if it's not Christ. And so we have to stay focused as a church on Jesus, and we need to keep Jesus at the center of what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing. And you say, Pastor, shouldn't that be easy? I mean, you're a pastor. You're a minister. This is church. Isn't that kind of 101? You think it would be easy, but I promise you it's not. There are a lot of opportunities to get distracted as a church, as a pastor. There's a lot of opportunities to get distracted as a congregation. There's a, a lot of things that people project upon what they want the church to be. And the church can have multifaceted expression, and there are ministries that can be birthed out of what we do, but our foundation has to be Jesus. So the foundation of our church is not a social club. Did you know that? You know, people can come to church for a lot of different reasons. Not everyone who comes to church comes to church for Jesus. Sometimes they come to church to check out the scene. I experienced some of this when I was a teenage boy going to youth ministry. But, and that's okay. The Lord may use that. The Lord may use that, but if that's the reason that you stay at church, I'm telling you, you're not going to last. Jesus wants you to come to church and be a part of his church for him first and foremost. To know him, to grow in him, to worship him, to pray to him, to serve him, to live for him, to be transformed by him. That's why he wants you to come to church. And maybe you're not there yet. That's okay. We don't judge you, but we're going to help you get there by God's grace. Now, we're not, first and foremost, a social club. We want to be a spiritual family. We want to be brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to be the family of God. And we do that by starting with the foundation of faith in Jesus. And saying, I believe in Jesus and Jesus alone. I believe I'm a disciple of Christ. If you're not there yet, we want to pray with you before you leave this morning. You know that we're not, we're not built on a foundation of social services. Did you know that? We want to demonstrate our faith through good works. We want to serve our city. We want to be salt and light. We want to meet needs, but it's not the foundation of who we are. And there's times where people are confused. They come to us, and they want to interface with us like we are social services. 
The, the, the needs that we meet, the practical needs that we meet in our community come from an overflow of faith in Christ. And we do want to be a witness, but it's not our, fir- our first calling is to minister to him. Our first calling is to, is to be a house that's built upon him. And it's from that place of overflow of faith in Christ where we will meet needs in our city, but we, inf- we are first and foremost the bride of Christ, not social services. We're not building our house on a personality. And those who know me very well would say amen because I don't have a big personality, all right? I, you know, we're not building this thing off an individual's charisma. We want to build this thing off faith in Jesus and the common bond that we can have together through collective faith in Jesus. That's what we want to build this house on. If you're at this church for two years and, and you feel all alone and you feel like you don't know anybody and, and, and you don't feel like anybody cares, uh, we're missing it somewhere. We're missing it in translation. Either you haven't taken some steps to get connected or we, we've missed some opportunities to connect with you because we want you to have real connection to the body of Christ. Proximity on Sunday does not equal community on Monday. Just because you sit next to someone in proximity on Sunday doesn't mean you're in real Christ-centered community, right? And so I don't want this to be built on my personality. I want this to be built on a real Christ-centered community, amen? That's what will, that, that's what will endure trials and tests in our times. Do you know that we're not built on competing with other churches? Do you know that? Well, pastor, this church down the street is doing X, Y, and Z. We should probably do that too. Hey, praise God for that. God bless them. Maybe we'll do that one day. Maybe that's the grace on that house. But we're not, we're not building a church to go after other Christians. It's called transfer growth in church, behind the curtains in church world. Well, is that real growth or is that transfer growth? I'm okay. I know we'll have Christians that come to our church from other churches. That's okay. God can use that. I'm just telling you that is not our focus. I I am well aware that there are millions of people in our city that don't have a church right now. There are millions of people in our city. They moved here from someplace else. They were going to a church in another state, and since they've been living in Las Vegas for a year, they haven't gone to church since. We are here for them. We want to reach them. We want to find the people that have no church. So we're not competing with other churches. When I'm trying to minister to someone who doesn't have a church, someone who doesn't have faith in Christ, I'm not competing with any other church. I'm competing with what the enemy is trying to do to hold them back in their spiritual journey. And I want to defeat the warfare over their life so that the blinders can come off and they can thrive in their relationship with Jesus. That's what I'm competing with, not other churches. So we're not a social club. We're not social services. We're not built on a personality. We're not competing with other churches. Uh Uh-oh, we're not a political campaign. Oh, oh my goodness, that's in my notes right there. We are not a political campaign. Well, we should be a church that stands for things, and we shouldn't be intimidated. Of course. There should be no mystery about what we stand for. Freedom of religion? You don't know where we stand on freedom of religion? If you didn't know, we're for freedom of religion at uh, ICLV. If you didn't know that, we're for freedom of religion. That might be a big shocker. We're for freedom of religion. Freedom of speech. We're for freedom of speech because we believe where there's open dialogue, truth will always win. Where there's open dialogue, truth will always prevail. We believe in freedom of speech, freedom of religion. We believe in the sanctity of life. That's not a mystery. We believe that God has created us in his image, that we are knitted together in our mother's womb, so we believe in sanctity of life. We believe in traditional marriage and family values. This isn't news. This isn't anything new. These are things we believe in and stand for. But I am not called to campaign for a politician. I'm not called to that. I have a higher calling. And you can't make me do it because it's a free country. You can't make me. We, we pray for the election. As a, as a believer, as a disciple of Christ, since I've been a voting age, I have, I have participated in every major election since I was 18 years old. And I pray and I vote my values, right? But as a pastor, I am not going to micromanage you and hold everybody's hand and tell everybody what they have to do. when it comes. I mean, sometimes I go into that voting booth and I got to hold my nose when I vote. 
for the lesser of two evils. Oh, I'm making some people so mad right now. Making people so mad. Uh, let, me, let me just get ahead. Let me help you get ahead. Let me help you get, you, like our perspective's right here. Let me help you get ahead. There's going to be an election in November. And there's going to be, uh, there's going to be a present for another four years, really only four more years of whoever gets elected because they can only do, you know, one, one, one more term. And here's what's going to happen. Whether it's your candidate or whether it's not your candidate, here's what's going to happen. Half of our country is going to be divided. Unless there's a new trend, and, and I would pray for a new trend. This has been going on for 25 years. I pray there's a new trend. If there's a new trend, I will welcome it. But let me tell you the final result. Half our country will hate each other. That's what breaks my heart. We could still be on the brink of civil war, even if your candidate wins. But you know if we had a great awakening? Do you know if, if we had a, you know in the, the, the great awakening in the late 1700s, you know there was hundreds of thousands of people that came to Christ in America? Do you know if we had another great awakening, it would change the unity and the tone in our country? We wouldn't be so polarized. We wouldn't be so divisive. We'd have a universal moral ethic that we could buy into. Could, could you just imagine that there was so much revival in our country that when we got into a presidential election, we'd actually have two good options that we'd be okay with? Do you know that's possible? It's possible. I don't think we're there right now. <laughs> but it's possible. And so I want to build on the rock. Politics is a shortcut in people's minds. If I just get my candidate in, then all the problems will go away. No, we're still going to be divided because we're not a Christian nation. We need to pray for the mercy of God to be poured out in our day. And if you pay attention... If you pay attention, the tactics of our enemy that are trying to reprogram our youth, they're being exposed for the foolishness that they are. It's playing into God's people are seeing that, that, that all the different societal evolutions that are trying to be implemented, they don't really address the core issues of depression. That's why we believe the word of God. I'm getting ahead of my sermon. That's why I believe that the word of God says we are created in God's image. We're born into sin, but because Jesus died on a cross for our sin and rose from the grave for eternal life, we can be redeemed from the curse of sin and experience to, to the full the image of God that we've been created in the likeness of. So if someone comes to you, young people, and says that you're born in the wrong body, I'm telling you, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And we want you to know the word of God over your life. You weren't born in the wrong body. Don't believe that junk. No, he wants to set the captive free. He wants to give you a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness, thinking that you're born in the wrong body will leave you in a worse place than you started off. That's the truth, and I love you enough to tell you that. I'm lost in my message here. Okay, this Isaiah 2.2, I don't believe this is in the notes unless you guys added it from last service. Isaiah 2.2 did you guys, oh, look at you guys. You guys are good. It says this, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. This is obviously a prophecy originally meant for Israel, and it still is relevant to Israel about the, the temple mount and it being the place for people to come and worship God and, and uh, learn about the ways of God. But there's also a, a prophetic interpretation of it. In Revelation, we learn that mountains are symbolic of kingdoms. So when you see mountains, it can also be interpreted prophetically as a kingdom. So it says that the, the kingdom of the Lord's house, God's kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord's house, it will be established as the highest of kingdoms. The highest. Someone say highest. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it both physically and maybe, maybe digitally will stream to it. I don't know if there's an internet uh, prophetic interpretation there, but it says, well, they'll stream to it. So here's the thing. There's a teaching out there that there are many kingdoms in the earth. There's the kingdom of education. There's the kingdom of government. And, and there's the kingdom of media. And there's, there's, there's all these different kingdoms in the earth. And the Lord wants us to impact those kingdoms for his glory, to influence those kingdoms for his glory. That is all true. And I say yes and amen. Here's what we have to make sure. The, the king, God's kingdom is not one of those kingdoms. God's kingdom is the higher kingdom. And it's from the higher kingdom that we can influence the other kingdoms. 
And so if you're here this morning and you're called to the kingdom of government and you're called to the kingdom of politics, I want to pray over you. I want to release the God's anointing over you. I want to release the prophetic word over you. I want you to go out and be salt and light for Jesus. Go take that kingdom. And it's from the higher kingdom that will anoint you to go out and take that kingdom. But that's not the kingdom that I'm in right here on Sunday mornings. I'm in the higher kingdom. We're in the kingdom of getting the anointing from God to go out and influence the other kingdoms for Jesus. Amen? So we have a powerful calling as a church, and we must contend not to fall beneath our calling. Oh, I'm making some people mad. It's okay. I love you. Listen, I love you. I promise you there's there's like thousands of scriptures for everything I just said. Okay, I promise you. I've done the work. Okay. The next point is this. A foundation built on Christ will prioritize the word of God. A foundation built on Christ will prioritize the word of God. Everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine, he had just finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount leading up to Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27. So it's talking about everything he just preached, but it's talking about his entire teaching because Jesus was the fulfillment of the old covenant. And so the entire, The entire canon of scripture is the word of Jesus. And that's why we have to stay focused on this book right here. This is what this church is built on right here. We are a 501c3. We are a nonprofit on paper. We are an organization. And in case you didn't know this, we are not built on on manufacturing and selling widgets. That's not, that's not the, the service and value that we provide as an organization. There's a lot of things we want to do. We want to have a multifaceted expression as the International Church of Las Vegas. But I just want you to hear from your pastor. The main thing, the most important thing, the priority thing we do is we teach, spread, and share the Word of God. That's what we do as a church. That's what we're in the business of. That's what we're about. I remember being nominated to be the the pastor of the church, and I was going to get voted on to be a pastor of the church, and I had people come to me, and and, and this isn't to mock the people coming to me, but it's just there's a conversation that happens in your head, and they go, go, Pastor Andrew, I just got to know, if you're the pastor of the church, what are you going to do here? What are you going to do? What's your vision? What's your revelation? And that's a very fair question, I understand. But I knew that the answer I had really wasn't going to satisfy them. Because God does give vision. God does give revelation. God is, God, God is going to give us a unique position and a unique grace in his body and in this city to represent him. But really, my answer was very simple. Uh, I'm going to open up the Bible, and I'm going to teach the Bible on Sunday mornings. And we're going to learn from the Word of God. And it's not anything new. I'm not saying that wasn't happening before. I'm just saying, this is my focus. We're going to talk about the, the Bible. And we're going to talk about the word. And we're going to try to apply it to our lives. And then we're going to try to apply it to us as an organization. And we're going to try to live it out. And and it says in Mark 16 that it says that the disciples went, went about everywhere teaching the word of God. And God confirmed his word through miracle signs and wonders. That as we get into the word and as we learn the word which leads us to Christ and we put it into practice in our life, we're going to be interfacing with the resurrected living Christ. And he's going to be doing things in our midst, doing things in our altars, doing things in our lives, our marriages, our families, doing things in our schools and in our businesses and in the marketplaces because we're in his word. It's not the only thing we're going to do here, but it's the foundation of what we're doing here is we're in his word. We're going to build on the rock. I'm, I promise you that is more than enough. Because as we dig into it, we dig into the true reality of the world we're living in. People need to hear the truth. First Corinthians 13, it says, it's the love chapter. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. I believe it's 13.6. But it's right there in First Corinthians 13 that there is no truth. There is no love without truth. So when we're preparing a meal in our home uh, with our three boys, Camille and I, our boys know from their ages 4 to to, uh, 11, they know don't touch the stove, don't touch the oven. Because if we do, we'll, we'll burn our hands. When we're going for a walk to the park, they know don't just run out in the middle of the street where there's traffic or else you can get hit by a car and end up in the emergency room. Why do they know that? Because we love them. We love them enough to tell them the truth. And in the same way, we love 
people enough to tell them the truth of God's word. That we are all appointed, according to Hebrews 9, we're all appointed to live once, die, and then we're going to face an accountability for our life called the judgment. And that after this life, there is an eternity in heaven or in hell. And that there is only one person who's died for our eternal life. His name is Jesus. He died on a cross for our sin and rose from the grave. And you got to put your faith in him if you want to know that your name is written in heaven. We don't tell you that because we think we're better than everybody. We don't tell you that because it scratches an itch to say there's some people that might be going to hell. No, no, no. We're telling you that because we all needed Jesus in our life. And he is so good. Once we invited Jesus, we were so blessed and we were transformed and we were set free and we were changed. And we want everybody else to know this as well. We love people enough to tell them the truth from God's word. <laughs> and so any foundation other than Christ is a temporary distraction. A foundation built on Christ will prioritize the word of God. And a foundation built on Christ will put into practice one's obedience to the word of God. I want to invite the worship team to come back up here. We need all this effort converges in us actually putting into practice the word of God. That's why we have Sunday morning worship. That's why we open up the altars for prayer. That's why we have discipleship steps with, with uh, you know, Alpha and Growth Track and Dad Inc. workshops and small groups and Moms Connect and marriage groups and young adult groups and, 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 and we have youth ministry and children. Why, that's why, we, why we're putting into practice the Word of God. That's why we serve our community. That's why we partner with other organizations in our city. Why? We're putting the Word of God into practice so that we can build on the rock. Do you know that building on the rock, it takes more work than building on sand? It's harder. It's easier and quicker to build something on the sand. It's just not going to last that long. That's why I talk about the shortcut, right? I'm not in for the shortcut. I'm in for the hard work. I want to lead people to Jesus one by one. And as long as there's someone who doesn't know Jesus, I want to reach them. I want to find them. And I want to lead them to their Savior one by one. It's hard work, but there's permanent change. There's fruit that remains. You know, if you lived here in Vegas long enough, you're familiar that we have a, a unique topography in our soil that when you get down low enough, you, you might eventually hit this layer of rock known as caliche. Does anybody know what I'm talking about, right? And I don't know about you, I was growing up just across the street, and I remember we had a neighbor behind us. They began to put in a pool, not an above-ground pool, a below-ground pool, and they began to dig. And whatever the time of morning when construction workers can begin, I don't know if it's like 7 a.m. or 7.30 or 8 a.m., whatever it was, there were several mornings I was still sleeping. God bless the construction workers who were all up before us. But it was kind of a rude awakening because the way you, 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 you do a pool with some caliche in the ground is you bring in a giant drill. And first thing in the morning, a couple times as a kid, I'd wake up to do, 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 it's just all day long. What a blessing. What a blessing. What were they doing? They were getting into the rock. They were doing the hard work to get that pool. And, and that once that pool was dug out, it was permanent because it was dug out of the rock. But it was, we, we, we had a pool in our backyard. It was an above ground pool. I, my guess is it's no longer there. It was a temporary structure. It wasn't built in the rock. And so it takes more work to build on the rock. You have to have a longer view in mind. But the Bible says there will be fruit and there will be fruit that remains. See, the foundation of Christ is stronger than the test trials and tribulations of this life. We're promised many things in the word of God, many blessings. God has a plan for your life, a plan not to harm you, but to prosper you, a plan for a hope and a future. He wants to provide for you. He wants to bring freedom in your life. He wants to bring the fruit of the spirit in your life, love, joy, peace, patience, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. He wants to release all of it in your life. But the Bible doesn't say we're not going to have any adversity. It rains on the just and the unjust. It's 
why you need to build on the rock. I'm concerned about a, a certain element of Christian teaching today which hyper-focuses on God's blessing. Again, I believe God wants to bless you. But some elements of this teaching can almost create a perception that you're only really spiritual if you have no adversity in your life. That a lack of adversity is a sign of deep spirituality. I have a question for you. If there's no adversity in your life, what good is your faith for? If you don't have any opposition, if you don't have any resistance, why do you need faith? And how strong is your faith? See, the strength of my faith is revealed when I'm in the midst of adversity, when I'm in the midst of opposition, when I'm in the midst of trial, when a big storm is coming in, then the strength of my foundation is revealed. It's the same for an individual as it is for a church. We want to do the hard work of building on the rock so that we can be strong. We can be strong for what's going to happen in the future. Hallelujah. Can we all stand to our feet this morning? Come on, can we sing Give Me Jesus just for a moment? Just for a moment. Can we sing that? Give me Jesus. Do you want the rock this morning? If you do, I want you to sing this out. Give me you for your grace, Lord God, to be a healthy church. We ask you for a grace, Lord God, to represent you in a lost and hurting world. Lord, we live in a perverse generation, the Word of God says, a corrupted and perverse generation. We live in a country, Lord. We have moved away from the foundation of Christ in our society, Lord. We have moved away from biblical Judeo-Christian values in our society, Lord God. And when the storms are coming, Lord God, houses are falling, Lord God. People are committing suicide, Lord God. People are addicted to drugs. People are committing mass shootings, Lord God. We are seeing the consequences, Lord, of a society built on sand. And we say, Lord God, we need your mercy in this day. Come on, if you want to agree with me right now in prayer for our country, Lord, we need the rock. We need the rock that is Jesus. And we say, Lord, our faith and our hope is in you and you alone, Lord God, because of what you've done in all of our lives. There's no politician that rescued me from the depression of losing my father at the age of 16. It was Jesus. There was no societal structure that brought me up out of addiction and brought me up out of habitual sin. It was the power of the Holy Spirit through the resurrection of Christ. 
Lord, we testify of your goodness this morning. And we say, if you did it in us, you can do it in others, Lord God. And you can do it in this city, and you can do it in this country. Would you help us, God, in Jesus' name? Come on, we're going to close this service in a minute. And before I do, you're here this morning, and you say, Pastor, I don't know where I'm at with Jesus. If I could ask just for no one to move around, if possible. You say, I don't know where I'm at with Jesus this morning. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And it's that simple. You can pray a prayer with me this morning, and you can leave this place knowing that your name is written in heaven. Jesus didn't go through a gory death on the cross so you could be on the fence, so you could be unsure, so you could gamble and roll the dice until you die one day and find out when it's too late. No, he died on a cross and rose from the grave so you could accept him as your Lord and Savior, so you could be forgiven, so you could be a disciple of him, and you could you could experience all that he has for you. So with every Christian praying here, I'm going to count to three, and if you need to pray with me this morning, I want to pray with you. I'm going to count to three, and when we get to three, I just want you to slip up a hand. If you need to take care of some business with God, we are here for it. We are down for it. It's going to happen today. It's not an accident that you're here. Today is your day. Come on, pray with me, Christians, right now. I'm going to count to three. One, you need to get right with God this morning. Two, the Holy Spirit is stirring in your heart. Three, I want you to lift up a hand right now to me and Jesus in this place. Lift up a hand. Yes, yes, yes. I want to pray with you. Yes, I want to pray with you. Come on, you're not the only one. Yes, hands in the risers on the floor. You're not the only one. Come on, here's what we're going to do. The worship team's going to begin to play. I want to pray with you right down here. Don't look around to your left and right. Step out of your seat. Meet me right down here right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on down. Come on down. this morning. Come on, they're still coming. We got revival breaking out down here. We got people coming to Jesus this morning. Are you guys excited? Here's the, we got a, we got a Niner fan and a Raider fan getting saved this morning right next to each other. Come on, come on, Jesus is moving. <laughs> Go ahead and close your eyes. Close your eyes. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me out loud. We're all gonna say this prayer together with you this morning. There's no magic in the words. Just say it with a heart of childlike faith. Say this out loud. Say, Lord Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me on the cross and rising from the grave. Forgive me this morning, Lord. Cleanse me this morning, Lord. I'm turning from my old life and I want to follow you from this moment on and the rest of my days, in Jesus' name. Now just keep your eyes closed. Lord, I pray for each person up here. Lord, they are reaching out to you. The Bible says that all of heaven is rejoicing right now, that the angels in heaven are throwing a party. Because we declare along with your word that their sins, which were like scarlet, Lord God, they have been washed as white as the snow on Mount Charleston, Lord God. 
Father, you have cleansed them, Lord God. You have filled them with your love. And you are filling them with the power of your Holy Spirit right now. And you are bringing healing, Lord God. You're bringing healing, Lord, from depression. You're bringing healing, Lord God, from addiction, Lord God. You're bringing healing from unbelief, Lord God from doubt and discouragement, Lord God, and you're releasing freedom, Lord, because the Word of God says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, Lord God. We declare freedom over your children this morning, God. These are your sons and your daughters. You are their Father. And this is a beautiful work that you're doing this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's so many. I can barely even get to everybody here this morning. Father, we just bless each and every person this morning, God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, church, can we give it up? Can we give it up? Listen. The Lord's doing something real here this morning because you guys are getting real with God. The Bible says that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You guys have humbled yourself this morning and God is releasing his grace upon your life. This is a big deal to the Lord. And this is a big deal to heaven. This is a big deal to us. And before you leave, we would just love the privilege and honor of praying with you individually. Before you go, if you turn around, we have a leader right behind you. We just wanna agree with you personally in prayer before you go and share some resources with you. Church, can we give the Lord praise one more time, one more time. Oh man. Come on, let's build a church on the rock. Amen, church. Let's build it on the rock. For his glory. For his glory. Hey, we want to see you out next week as we continue this series. We pray you have a blessed week. We love you, church. We'll be up front if you need any ministry. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, thanks again for checking out ICLB here on YouTube. Hope you're already subscribed, getting notifications. Make sure you're following us on all our social media channels. Download our mobile app and check us out Sundays, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., online, in person. We want to see you there. God bless.